Hi everybody, my name's Am I on? So, hi everybody, my name's TJ Myhill. I'm an attorney here in Atlanta. I'm at uh, the Atlanta office of Stites and Harbison. Uh, I do internet, IP, and business law and litigation. And uh, I'm here to speak on the legal aspects of uh, Title IX and some of the new proposed rulemaking. I'll let my co-panelists introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I am, uh, well, my government name here is Van Vandiver Elizabeth Glenn. I go by Vandy Beth. I am I'm a transgender comedian and filmmaker, and I was also part of a lawsuit a few years ago called Glenn v. Brumby. I, when I transitioned, I was working at the state government, and my boss fired me for transitioning, and it became this whole thing. I look it up if you like, Glenn v. Brumby, and... I have never played I have never played sports in school, but I am transgender and apparently that's enough. So uh, let's talk about Title IX. Well, so let's talk about Title IX. Title IX is from the uh, the Education Act 1972, and it's Title IX deals specifically with sex in school and sex discrimination in school. I should say that more clearly. It does not deal with sex in school. <laughs> no, well, gender now, but not then. Um, so it, 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 it was sexual equality in any school uh, or uh, program that received federal funding. So if your school receives federal funding, and they all do, then you cannot discriminate in any way on programs available to students based on sex. And what Title IX often applies to is athletics. Uh, Title IX covers a much more broad area of things. It covers sexual harassment. It covers uh, employment. There's a number of things that it covers. But the one that is most often thought about when we talk about Title IX in schools and the one that is relevant to today's discussion is that it governs sports programs because equal access to education and educational programs includes the educational extracurricular programs that the school provides. If you're going to have a team, you have to have the same amount of opportunities for men and women in your athletic program. They don't have to be the same opportunities necessarily. That's why most schools don't have a women's football team. But you have to have equal opportunity and access to programs based on sex. Gender wasn't originally part of the idea. But we have had some proposed rulemaking that says that, that gender and gender identity would now be governed by the Title IX sex discrimination. That's one of the, that's one of the proposed rulemakings that come around. The other one <coughs> that came out this year is some proposed rulemaking from the Biden administration that governs trans athletes in sports and what, what team they get to play on, essentially. Uh, do they get to participate in the sport of their preferred identity, or do they have to participate in the sport of their birth gender? And the proposed rulemaking that came out earlier this year is that there can be no blanket ban on trans athletes. There, there can be no prohibition on allowing trans athletes to participate in the the team of their choosing but there can be reasonable restrictions placed on that and, and reasonable I don't want to say accommodations but I can't think of the right word because it's Sunday morning and I had a very late Saturday night but there can be reasonable limits on what um, what people can select to do so in other words at the elementary level, uh, you know, when you're when you're doing youth sports, when you've got youth leagues, there's not going to be any prohibition on trans athletes participating in the in the team that aligns with their with their gender. But there's as we get into high school, college, more competitive leagues, there may be the ability to put restrictions in on who can participate based on those competitiveness questions, 
uh, unfair advantage questions, injury questions, danger to the participant. Um, and so that that is something that under the new proposed rulemaking, schools would each be allowed to determine on their own. So what we have now is Title IX says we have to have equal access to sex, uh, uh, equal, ac <laughs> equal access <laughs> to sports for both sex. Title IX now says that gender is covered by the same sex discrimination and we are trying to have proposed rulemaking that says Title IX would allow trans athletes to, to play on their chosen team unless the school has a good reason otherwise. So I think that's kind of the, the, the core of the, of the question. So uh, I'll, I'll go to you. Are there any questions of trans athletes that I mean, what, what, what prompted the question of, of trans athletes in Title IX, I think, is the way to phrase that. Well, there's been a lot of concern trolling about uh, trans kids playing sports um, and the, in, the, in the name of fairness. And it should, be, it should be established that when people complain about trans people playing, playing sports, they usually are talking about trans women or trans girls trans men or trans boys are also out there but they a appear to be a, a total non-issue um, which uh, you know if they if the, if the people opposed to this really thought about it then that that could be a, something they would think about because um, uh, there is some selectability in the amount of testosterone that a that a, a trans masculine person uh, takes and um, I don't know if if that is regulated in a way in a way that would prevent a trans kid from having more testosterone in their body than uh, than cisgender boys. But you know, um, I think it, I think it's generally recognized that Michael Phelps has more testosterone in his body than uh, most ordinary um, cisgender men. So. Uh, should it even be uh, disallowed for, for trans boys to essentially dope while while playing sports? Um, but again, that's not getting a lot of a lot of the attention. The, a lot of the attention, most of the attention, is coming to, to trans women like like Leah Thomas, the swimmer who has been competing in college swimming and, and has had the nerve to actually be good at it. Um, t testosterone has a tremendous effect on one's strength and speed. I can attest to that. I've been a runner for most of my adult life, both before and after my transition. And um, it, it, when there's no testosterone in your body, it makes a huge difference in your ability. And I, I think it. I think it, it should be uncontroversial that trans women, uh, when certain when certain schema are are established, like you must have must have transitioned, you know, for a certain uh, a, a amount of time, uh, they don't. They simply don't have any advantage over other uh, over cisgender women that they compete with. And that was one of the original. Um regulations on trans athletes you had to have you had to have transition for at least i think it was 12 months uh before you right. before you were able to participate in certain athletics so that you would have the 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 appropriate you know level of testosterone for your for your selected uh for your selected sport but it, it, that's the real question i mean what what advantages do we have? The concern, the concern that that everyone seems to raise, again, mostly about trans women rather than trans men, is that they're having gone through puberty, they're bigger, they're stronger, they have more height, they have more advantage. Well, I mean, there are plenty of very very tall cis women. There are plenty of very very strong cis women, and you know, I I don't. I don't care how many times I go through puberty, I'm not going to outswim Michael Phelps. <laughs> Some people just have natural advantages and they're and, and they're built for, you know, success in certain in certain sports. So 
to suggest that that someone's going to get an unfair advantage, it's a it's an interesting question in sports because there are people who have unfair advantage. That's why they're good at their sport. So, I think the the the, the new proposed rulemaking allows the school to take into account those types of, of competitiveness questions and safety questions. I think one of the larger concerns that we will see coming for trans men, although I just don't know that there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, participants uh, in this situation, would be a safety issue. If someone who is a very, very small trans man wants to join the football team, I mean it doesn't always end like Rudy, right? You might get hit by a 400-pound linebacker and, and, and suffer some severe injuries. So there is some concern about about danger in the sports and, and, and making appropriate regulations around that. I do think it's interesting well, well, to he me. Would be, he, would, he, would be, he would be facing only the same issues that a, a similarly small cisgender man would be facing. 100%. 100%. But we... I wouldn't try out for the football team either. <laughs> so, I mean, I you, you, knowing your limitations, I think that, again, that's why I think that's a safety concern. It's a safety issue that might come up, but I don't. I think it's going to be a self-regulating issue because I don't think the five foot, hundred pound person is going to try out for football, whether they're cis, trans, or 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 whatever. Um, I lost my thought. Um, I, the, the, as far as the, the question of, of regulation, what are the concerns about having the schools independently regulate these athletes or these programs rather than the NCAA or some other sports governing body? I find that very troubling because I think you, you're going to – you would have, quickly have a race to the bottom where, where – uh, I, I mean, you know, enlightened, enlightened school districts like – Places I would assume in, in New York City, or you know the Deca- Decatur school system here in the Atlanta area, uh, would have progressive policies. But but you would have quite a few quite a few school districts that would be quite progressive in their policies. And I, I would I would think you would want to have a, a universal standard. Yeah, I think that's the challenge of something like uh, you know terms like safety or competitiveness what, what does competitiveness mean if you're better does that mean that you're too good now i'm going to take you out of the sport that that does i think leave open a lot of of question about how schools would implement this so what about the idea that some of the some of the uh, sports leagues professional sports leagues or or, or uh, you know uh, high level sports leagues are putting in their own applications that are then being followed by ncaa or some of the other you know, youth sports. Um, what are your thoughts on 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 that? Taking the lead from those professional programs or or top tier programs and bringing them down. Well, I should ask, I offer the caveat that I don't know a lot about sports and I don't follow any sports, but um, I do know that that some of these organizations, like the NCAA, have thought long and hard about this and they have consulted. You know, they've consulted physicians and scientists who actually know what they're talking about, uh, and uh, I know they've they've established guidelines. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the in female boxing, for example, uh, there's uh, there are a few trans boxers, and and the rules have been set, and they're they're being abided by, and you know, if if those governing bodies are satisfied that they're working. Then I, I, you know I don't see any reason to to complain about it, and you know, other other organizations can can look to that success and and maybe well founded in in choosing similar policies. One of the things I know from enough EFF panels over the years is that you guys tend to have lots of questions. So why don't we just go ahead and open the floor to questions while we're talking? Yeah. If you have any questions, please just come up. Excuse me. Come up. There's the hiccups. <laughs> Please just come up to the mic. And, Do you need me uh, to scare you? Do you need me to scare you? <laughs> oh. I liked how you opened it um, by mentioning the concern trolling, and I wonder if by getting into all this nitty-gritty, like maybe are we getting trolled? Is it is it possibly the wrong approach to, to do all this, like, careful, measured, like, reasoning and exploration into the science of it when 
that doesn't really seem to be what the other side is interested in anyway like won't that just get ignored well i think that comes down to the question of what schools will do with it what each how each school will independently address the question um yeah it, it, it is absolutely the 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 issue if you're if you have legitimate questions about competitiveness, if you have legitimate questions about unfair advantage, we can look to the science, we can look to the data, we can look to the actual athletes and see what's what's happening and what's 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 appropriate. Um, but I think when we when we open it up to the idea of, well, we want to make sure that that everyone is is being treated fairly. Fairly means different things to different people, and that's a, a again a concern that I have uh, that, that we've expressed that I, I think if schools are going to individually apply the rules in in ways that please their own funding please their own please their own backers so yeah and unfortunately this isn't an issue where you, if you just ignore the bully they go away Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I mean, if, if it's made an issue, then it is an issue, whether it's le legitimate or not, and it, it still has to be dealt with and addressed. I mean, I think I meant more on the sort of like national discourse thing, like, is it a matter of should we discuss the, you know, specific concerns that are being brought up, or should we more talk about this as a, like, this is, you know, the right is bringing this up as a way to torture trans kids, not because yeah. they're really concerned about fairness. Well, let me let me let me take two responses to that. One is the legal response and one is the the vocal response. The legal response is that we don't want law to move quickly. We don't want law to be reactionary. We don't want law to be we want law to be measured and reasoned and implemented in ways that are measurable and repeatable and can be used and, and analyzed and addressed and ruled on by courts in the same way, or at least in substantially the same way. So when we're proposing law, we do need it to be that type of reasoned, measured, scientific, hopefully, yeah, approach to the, to the law and the law change itself. In response to the concerns is the law the the right and only measure? Certainly, civil rights laws are important. They are they are the way that that we make sure that we keep things as fair as possible for as many as people as possible. But we don't get civil rights by we don't get civil rights by waiting for the government to give them to us. So, don't don't think that what the law says is the only way to go about challenging those issues. So one question and one comment. So um, where does, and I apologize if I'm saying the name wrong, where do you think the Hecox uh, v. Miller case out of the Ninth Circuit from last month falls in this discussion in terms of the, you know, uh, challenging the Idaho ban and upholding the, you know, the lower court's um, injunction. And then the comment I would make is, is when you talked about rulemaking, I think that unless you have the athletic leagues themselves set the rules, um, sort of like what happened in Vermont, right, where the earlier in March they banned the team that decided not to play in the tournament from further tournaments, you can have all the rules you want, but if there's no consequences for people opting out, trying to marginalize trans athletes, then I don't think you're going to get progress. Well, let me address that one first, because that's where Title IX comes in. Title, Title IX takes away your money if you, don't, if you don't comply. Now, again, it comes to the question of does the school policy or does the league policy or does the, does the do those policies work? I actually, I don't want you to step away from the mic because I don't know the answer to your first question because I'm not familiar with the Hecox-Miller case. I would, I would ask you to just oh, tell, me the, tell me the facts of that and I can try to give you my response to it. So I don't know if everybody else, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I followed it, but 
Um, the Ninth Circuit decided August 17th to affirm in a two to one decision the lower court ban on Idaho's ban on transgender athletes on, on constitutional grounds. So they uphold, upheld the injunction. Problem is it's not necessarily a roadmap because it's really specific to the Idaho law and the Idaho law had um, infirmities, I would say, and I'm not speaking as a, I'm speaking as an employment lawyer, not, not necessarily as a, as a, as a school um, or, or you know, athletic lawyer, but it, it focused mostly on women's sports and not on men's sports. And part of the reason that the lower court determined that it was unconstitutional was that it, it, it didn't provide equally for both sides of the equation. So whether that means the legislature in Idaho is going to go back and review or revise it, I don't know. But it is a decision out there that I think is important in this discussion because they do cite that you know the concerns of Title IX, but mostly it's on an equal protection right. claim. So right, right, and that that that's 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 where the new policy making is coming from. It, it is it is absolutely prohibiting any type of blanket ban. So whereas. Um, from what I understood from the case, again, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the actual case, but if the if the Idaho law was a blanket ban, whether it was on just women's sports or all sports, Title IX, it, well, not yet, but with with the new proposed rulemaking, we the it's still open for comment. We we need to make sure we get through the comment section. Any any revisions get made. We don't know what the final 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 rule is going to say yet, but what it is expected to do is to have a, a, a prohibition on any type of blanket ban. So you cannot say that you cannot, as a trans woman, compete in a, in a man's sport, a women's, excuse me, women's sport. Is a trans man, you cannot compete in a man's sport. You, you cannot have that as a, as a blanket rule at any level for any sport in any league. That's the, that's the, the, the basis of the rulemaking. The, and again, the thinking is that the only restrictions that are going to be allowed are going to be based on hopefully measured and reasoned analysis of, of, of appropriate circumstances in each sport. So it's not even to say that once you hit middle school, you can no longer compete in the sport of your chosen gender. It's going to be very sport specific or, or, or activity specific. There's going to be different rules potentially for something like wrestling or football than there would be for um, I don't know badminton or volleyball or something like that. They're just you're not going to have the same analysis that goes in from from safety concerns or from sports concerns. Either these are the these are the suggestions at least that the administration is making that that it would be treated on a sport by sport and and basis. So I guess a couple things. Um, the first is having the federations do it seems a little dangerous. I don't know if you heard the recent news about the chess federation banning trans women from women's chess, yeah. literally. So that seems a little scary, I guess, right? Because we can that, debate just, whether chess is a sport, but it's on ESPN. So that's it's just insulting. You know, right? Yeah. Ridiculous. So there's that. And then also, I don't know if anybody else watches Stars on Mars. Has anybody seen this show? Okay. William Shatner hosted it. It's hysterical. It's on Hulu. Anyway, Lance Armstrong was on there and Adam Rapon was on there. These are two athletes. Adam Rapon's figure skater. Lance Armstrong, obviously, cyclist. Huge debate with Lance Armstrong being very negative on trans athletes. So that's just an interesting, like, commentary on that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and it was ridiculous. Okay, so I, I know those were not questions. Hear, I don't want to hear any of Lance Armstrong's complaints about right. people getting unfair advantages in sports. Right, <laughs> exactly. And it was, it was a big thing. The episode's very intriguing just from an anthropological perspective <laughs> to watch. Um, my question, more than anything, is and related to like the Castor Semenya case. Are you familiar at all with yes. her? Mm -hmm. um, she is, as far as we know born female, not a trans woman, mm -hmm. right, but with an incredibly high level of testosterone naturally occurring inside her body. And, uh, you know, how is that being approached as related to 
all of this. I won't. I won't swear to this, but I believe Castor Semenya was found to have an intersex condition. Um, I believe she had an. She has an undescended testicle. Um, I, please don't take that as gospel. But, uh, but it's an. It is an. It is an interesting case because. You know, people don't normally learn this thing about themselves. You know, most intersex conditions are completely invisible, even to the people who have them. And uh, this would never, this would never have come up um, if she hadn't been so good at her sport. And you know, in intersex people are also people, and they also get to be trans. Um, they also get to be athletes. And you know why is it? Why would it even be our business to, to make such determinations about Castro Semenya or about any athlete? You know, pe people are just the way they are. And I think that's good. that goes back to the first point that I made about athletes. There are plenty of athletes that have natural advantages, and uh, to 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 say that trans athletes who who may have you know, even lower testosterone than the cis women on their teams, or or significantly higher testosterone than the than the cis men on their teams, depending on you know their their own regimen. The 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 reality is that all of that spectrum exists in sport already. There are people who have much much higher testosterone, a much greater reach, a much greater height advantage. They're these things happen. That's what makes people good athletes. That's what makes Michael Phelps Michael Phelps, right? Shaq's not good at basketball because he's a cis man. He's good at basketball because he's 7'2 and 400 pounds. That makes you good at basketball. So it, it, it's, a, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a it's a weird thing to talk about height advantage or other advantages when those things are, are equally applicable to the the other athletes that's that's the other thing i will say about the federations that's that's one of my concerns some of these some of the sports federations you know the professional professional or or, or governing bodies uh, well if you're pro trans rights it's very concerning because some of them can be very very conservative groups of 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 people I mean, it tends to be you know the people who get to be in charge of things tend to be Old white guys, just we don't always make the best decision. <laughs> I have a comment and then a long winded question. Great. <coughs> so, as a woman in surgical menopause, it took me two years just to get my hormones tested to see if they're even in the levels they need to be. So, like, the fact that they're so, you know, worried about all these other people's hormones when you have to beg to even be tested in other situations is honestly just ridiculous because yeah everybody is different and it's what it comes down to and honestly why does it matter so now to my question i used to teach middle school and i got to teach a really fun critical thinking class in which there was no curriculum and i got to make it up um and one of the things i would always do with them is i would bring up this um article about people in college playing quidditch Okay, they came up with these Quidditch leagues, they'd run around with broomsticks, it was like a full contact sport, there was no gender or sex like rules or anything like that. And so I was like, I would make them debate on it, like the safety of it, right? And the classes, every single time, they would just come up with on their own after debating this for an hour, well, they either need to have more safety standards, like, you know, helmets and pads and everything, or they need to do weight classes. They never, ever, these middle schoolers came up, oh, girls have to play with the girls. Or, no, they just like, well, it's either, you know, weight classes or, you know, safety. So I'm just like, why is that not an obvious answer? And what am I missing that the rest of the world is like, oh, no, it's so much bigger than this? That's not the obvious answer because it doesn't serve any agenda. It doesn't serve the right wing agenda. You know, the, the 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 right wing voices who are making the most noise about this aren't really concerned about sports. They're concerned with with 
with imposing their their heteronormative cisnormative values on the rest of the world and uh, they are threatened by anything that that, that is not in accord with that and you know they they lost the fight on marriage equality and so now they've moved on to uh, uh, an even weaker or perceived as even an even weaker minority and, and now we're what we're going after it's not just in sports either it's also still in the bathrooms and you know we we're less than we're less than two percent of the population probably even less than one percent and uh, that's it's just the next th the next thing in the culture war that we're having to deal with right now one of the things I'll add about this is um, you know because now we're talking about the political side of it we, we are talking about rules that are being proposed by the current administration. One of the things about Title IX is it's, it's under the Department of Education, and it's, it's enforced by the Office of Civil Rights, and all of these are, are under the executive branch. The, the reason we can make proposed rule changes and, and make policy changes, it's not, it's not changing legislation. It's, it's changing the, 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 the way the rule is going to be interpreted and enforced. And those interpretations and enforcement change every time we change administration. If your administration supports those same ideas, they will enforce those same ideas. If the administration doesn't care one way or the other, maybe they don't bother changing anything. But if the administration is opposed to those ideas that are being put in place or thinks they ought to be very different than they are, that's when we start getting different notices of, of rulemaking. And again, one of the reasons that it takes so long to go through this process is that we try to avoid willy-nilly changes and, and, and people um, getting elected and, and reversing long-held civil rights issues with, with, with the stroke of a pen. But going through the policy making and going through the rule making isn't such a long or onerous process that people won't do it. So if, if you have strong opinions about which way you think these things should go, then I would remind you to read my shirt. For those in the back, it says just fucking vote, but. <laughs> Have we Anybody answered else? all your we questions? Can't possibly have covered everything. Have we completely solved this issue? <laughs> I would uh, like to share an anecdote during this lull. Um, how many of you here have heard of Renee Richards? A few of you. Uh, she was a trans woman in the 1970s who was also a tennis player. And uh, she wasn't allowed to play women's tennis. She, um, she sued and she won the right. And so women have been allowed to play uh, trans women have been allowed to play women's tennis for over 50 years now. When's the last time you ever heard of a transgender woman becoming a, a, a tennis champion in the U.S.? It hasn't happened. So for people who are complaining that there's some unfair advantage to trans women playing playing in sports, that is a, a sterling example of, uh, of the, the truth that it's just not the case. Okay, someone was moving toward the mic mm -hmm. when I'm... Oh, yeah, okay. Thanks. Just thought of the question here. <laughs> All right, so uh, wondering, we of course know that this is a, a primarily a, a political fight, actually. That's where it all comes in. Mm -hmm. So what's the current state on what are the leaders or who are the leaders pushing forward for this equality? Because we know that it's out there, but uh, we know it's a political fight. And political fight, that's exactly what it is, a fight. You have this side, that side, red, blue. Uh, what kind of actions currently uh, are being taken to advance that agenda? Uh, and of course, that will be on the political side. Right. Well, TJ, you probably know more about this than I do. I, I can say that I know that personally, Joe Biden and his family are all very, um, are all pro-trans rights. 
they are the, the the Bidens are very good friends with a woman named Sarah McBride, who is a state senator in Delaware, and is on pace right now to become the first transgender member of Congress. And uh, she has been working with the the Biden family for a long time. She was an aide to Bo Biden when he was Attorney General of Delaware. So, at, at least on a personal level, I know that the Bidens are very much on our side. You know, whether that translates into, into good action in the political realm is, is, of course, a separate question. And maybe, TJ, you can speak to that. Well, and that is where, I mean, obviously, that, that's where these rules are coming from. These rules are coming down from the Biden administration. They were put out in 2022, 2023, um, and, and they're going to be, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely this administration's provisions and policy making towards Title IX. Uh, who are the... Again, it's it's. It, I think there's two different questions there. Much like I, I I answered earlier, there's the legal question, and then there's the actual political civil rights question. Civil rights laws are different than are different than civil rights protests or demonstrations. We we get we get civil rights laws because of civil rights protests and demonstrations, and that's where I mean that's where we 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 start. So who's giving the who's giving the policies? Who's creating the you know who's the leader in 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 the the thrust for these changes? It is Joe Biden right now because he's the president and he gets to make the executive branch decisions and policies. I mean, I say Joe Biden in a blanket of the entire administration, but um, you know who's opposing it? Everyone who's opposing Joe Biden. Uh, but in terms of of outside the legislative process, outside the Title IX uh, rulemaking process. Who's in charge? You guys. You want to get out there and change the rules, change the rules. You want to get out there and, and, and make noise, make noise. If you think we're on the right track, say so. If you think we're on the wrong track, say so. Make good trouble. How are trans people that aren't currently physically transitioned being treated in professional sports right now? I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't honestly know the answer to that either. I don't. I, I don't know that. So, in in most of the leagues that the rules that I currently know and understand, there is the requirement that you have been undergoing transition therapy for some period of time in order to. In order to go to the other, you know, another team, uh, or or play on the team, that I, I, I heard it as soon as I said it. I heard it as soon as I said it. <laughs> but that's the point. It, 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 so, in order to, in order for a trans woman to play on the women's league, there has to be some transition process that has been in place long enough to accommodate that league's rules that 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 they are now appropriate to to participate in that league um i know that in in a lot of um just in my kids in in, in high school uh, my daughter's a fencer for example and we have uh you know trans or or agender people they're they're entitled to fence under their name of choice but they will still fence in the league of their of their birth gender, unless there is transition, uh, they, they've transitioned in place. So we have fencers who are, you know, who are fencing in the the women's bracket under, you know, male names. We have fencers who are fencing in the male bracket under female names, but they're still fencing in those brackets because the transition hasn't yet occurred. Okay. It Thank is a, you. It is a it is a good. A good question and a good point. You know, uh, people are not defined by their biology, and uh, you can be a trans person and not be undergoing any sort of medical care. Uh, uh, but uh, legally, legally, that's uh, it's a kind of a hard pull for a lot of people to take, especially with regards to sports. I, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a man named Kai Allums who played college basketball about 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, he was a trans man, and he, um, he played college basketball on a women's, on a women's team. He, um, 
he declared his transness and and socially transitioned um, and changed his name and dressed as a man and, and was accepted as a man by his teammates but he forwent forwent he put off he put off any of his medical transitioning until after his college career as a basketball player so you know, physically and 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 performance wise he was still performing as a woman uh, um, on a woman's team uh, even though he had already transitioned so that is i don't know how often that happens but that is that is one possible path thank you mm -hmm. I think that leads to the to the interesting question of what the what what Title IX is proposing. I I get the idea. I mean, I do get the idea of the rulemaking to to make it a a, a sport by sport and case by case basis. Um, I, I think that is I think that is an appropriate level of the law to take. Um, I do have some concerns about how people will interpret that those questions of competitiveness and safety but I do I do think that looking at things case by case and sport by sport are um, you know are, are are sensible but I do also think that to do that we should look at some of the questions that have already been in place we've already had some of these things um, in place again the the the, the rule on uh, you know time from transitioning to to ensure that all appropriate hormone levels are within the appropriate range for whatever sport that that I mean we we, we have those I, I don't disagree that it's kind of silly to focus on um, you know hormones in sports and and not just appropriate safety or whatever but it, it is uh, you know as <laughs> to bring up Lance Armstrong again you know we have we have the 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 testosterone ranges and the we want to find doping we want to find people who are who are cheating uh, in in their sport and and taking that unfair advantage but so we have that process in place and we already have an idea of what appropriate ranges of, of testosterone will be so it seems like if we can test for that or if we have a policy that it's 12 months or it's 18 months since you transitioned and that's in place that seems like a perfectly reasonable way to take that position um, rather than than looking at I don't know, taking too much of a political stance on it go for the science and not the politics always follow the science anyone else Here comes somebody. I'm not sure if I could phrase this correctly, but I guess a Go question for it. would be... Um, we'll let you know if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a master of phrasing things correctly all day, so... <laughs> I guess a bigger question or concern, is there any forethought or concern of how the intersectionality between other minority groups who are also placed into... Um, individuals who are now transitioning as well could be used to piggyback on um, why they may prevent um, someone from playing sports. So basically, if you are a trans woman who is part of a racial minority, that someone may also purport to being having an advantage and kind of that conversation that's been had throughout history and how that may connect there. I don't, well, I mean, racial minorities don't actually have any advantages, right. do they? No. <laughs> okay, no, but so I, then I, I would think that would be a non-issue then. Well, but I think that, that that raises, you know, a talking point, right? I mean, these are the right. same conversations we had when we were trying to talk about putting, you know, uh, athletes of color into the into the sports leagues. Breaking the color barrier was a, was a big step because... There was some thought of, of unfair advantage. Um, I think this is the same kind of conversation we are having now, um, and 
you know, that's the, so, so, so I do think that there is something that we can, yeah, we can look back to those conversations that were had and we can look at the arguments that were made and the counterpoints that were made and, and how we have now gotten to a point where, you know, athletes of color being on teams is, is a f- normal rather than unique thing. Um, and I, I do, I do think that we will find ourselves in a future where, you know, gender is, is, equally uh, you know hopefully a historical footnote uh, but um, I do think that that is a, a a a place to look for how we solve the problem the first time um, it is it is a bit of a different challenge now I think um, uh, just because of the well as Vandy Beth pointed out that the, I mean the the, the the level of the minority. I mean, it's just such a small percentage of the population that this affects. It's easier to it's easier to push people to the side when there's not as many of them to push back. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I completely agree on that. I think my question may just have come out kind of incorrect there, but it was more so because that question I have heard kind of like raised still to this day, and I was just wondering if like if that's a concern that that could ever come across again. That's kind of what I meant, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's going to be any, I mean, I, I, I do, obviously, I think if people are going to be discriminatory, they tend to not be discriminatory against just one person. Right. But uh, <laughs> um, so if you have a, 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 a trans athlete who's also from another minority group, are they going to be more, even more put upon? Y- yeah, I do think that's going to be the case. But um but does it change what's going to happen in terms of, uh, of the policy or the rulemaking or the or the decision making at either the school or the sport level? I don't think that I don't think that's going to have as much impact because again, we did have those those discussions and we we've we've moved not quite so as a society, but at least in sports we've moved beyond the 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 restrictiveness you know of of, of that of that type of analysis. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And since you since you bring up other other minorities, it's worth noting there's a. Unfortunately, we're having battles now about about trans access to to appropriate restrooms and public public restrooms. That is a very very old tactic of of conservatives of and of the right wing before before it was. Uh, trans people in restrooms it was gay people in restrooms before that of course we're all we're all living in the south here uh, before that it was it was a uh, um, different so, sorting the races into their own restrooms before that uh, it was Jewish people and in the Northeast it was even the Irish the Irish people were not considered white, and they were not allowed to use the same public restrooms as other people. So, it is a very old tactic, and it is it has always been wrong, and it has always been applied cynically uh, by people who probably actually know better and and are just trying to to be hateful. You have to say I don't really understand the argument on that front. I mean, if I, I, the the idea that oh, someone who is like me would throw on women's clothing just to go in the women's restroom and assault women. Well, first off, I can walk into the women's restroom anyway, right? No one's no one's checking at the door. I can walk in and harass the women all I want. But why would I? The idea that that this this strange boogeyman of a of a of a straight man in a dress showing up to 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 steal away your little girls or whatever is why would that person then also go through years of 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 you know legal and medical and all the other hoops you have to jump through for for transition for the lulls for just to (laughs) just go grab that one kid that's a lot of work man just get a van pull up with some free candy (laughs) I mean, the it, it, the boogeyman falls apart when you think about it for more than 30 seconds. It should also be noted that whenever laws like this are are passed to 
to persecute trans people, the first people, the first people who suffer as a result of them, the majority of people who suffer as a result of them, are cisgender people, who are not, who are not uh, sufficiently performing their gender to the right degree. That's, uh, you're always hearing about cis cisgender women who are who are just yeah, kind of masculine looking who go into restrooms and are and are beaten up or are arrested or are otherwise uh, harassed for uh, in the mistaken belief that they are trans women you know when you brought up the point earlier too that it's mostly trans women athletes who are the the concern trolling mm -hmm. um, you never really hear about the trans men restroom issue either. There's never the there's never the scary boogeyman trans man who's going to come into the bathroom and assault me. Nobody ever brings that concern to any to any light. No. That's partly because trans men tend to be more invisible than trans women. There's no way you would be able to police that. Anyone else? Okay. Well, well then, I, I guess we will uh, we, we will go ahead and and, and start uh, start wrapping up again. I'll just I'll just remind you guys that this is, um, you know, this is absolutely your fight to fight. The Title IX is here to help protect people. What does Title IX say about trans athletes in sports? It says we can have them, but it says they're going to be potentially treated differently even under the Biden administration. Under future administrations, who knows? But it really does come down to your participation, your involvement, your voice, your vote. It's, it's on all of us to make the changes that we want. It's on all of us to make the world we want to live in. And you know, some people have a different opinion on what that world looks like, and we need to make sure that we are out there sharing our voice so that people know that they are not alone in their opinions of what the world ought to look like. So Title IX is, like most laws, there to protect us from large entities. It is not there to, to create your rights. Title IX does not give you any rights. Title IX protects your civil rights that you have fought for over the years, just like so many other civil rights laws do. That's what needs to happen. That's where we continue to happen. That's what will continue to happen 200 years in the future when we find whatever next thing divides us, because something will always divide us, because that is just the way we work. But whatever it is, we will have this same response. And again, I would I, I think that was a valid question. I think we should look back to what we did in terms of, you know, integration in sports because that these are the exact same conversations that were being had about integration in sports when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball. This was this was the exact same conversation as Leah Thomas being a swimmer. So, I do think that these are things that that we have seen history we can, we can learn from our history, but please be active in your present. And if you think this isn't relevant to you, I'll, I'll point out that you, you probably have uh, trans friends and relatives, even if you don't think you do. And we deserve all our same rights as everyone else. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much.